Great today to have Coach Jim Crutchfield with us. Coach is currently the coach at uh, Nova Southeastern, and most of us would know his 13 seasons at West Liberty, where he had a tremendous success. His record was 359 and 61. And after two seasons at Nova Southeastern, it seems like you're on the same path, Coach. And right now, your winning percentage ranks the best of any coach in any division to coach NCAA men's basketball at least 10 seasons ever. Tremendous success. And welcome to the podcast and for taking some time to talk basketball with us, Coach. Always looking forward to talking basketball. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. And, you know, Coach, not a ton of information out there about what you guys actually have done to be so successful. So I know this is a great opportunity for all of us to learn. But let's start with your path to Nova Southeastern because you had tremendous success at West Liberty. But it seemed like the, the quote that stood out for me is that you left for a challenge. You left for the opportunity to see if you can turn around another program. Can you talk about that a little bit? And that is the sole reason that I left West Liberty because it was a great place, a great school, and had things going pretty well there. But I guess I wanted the challenge. I wanted to see if I could do it again. As a coach, I'd only been to one university, West Liberty University, and things had gone so well there. You always wonder, maybe the stars were just a line, maybe it was luck. So I wanted, I, I did want a challenge. And Nova Southeastern had not had a lot of success. And it was located in a good place here in South Florida. And thought, uh, at my age, you don't get that opportunity very often. Let's give it a shot. So that's what we're trying to do down here right now. Well, and it seems like you're on the right track. Certainly uh, success this year. And I believe one of the most successful seasons for Nova Southeastern ever, if I'm correct on that. And you're on that way. Yeah, uh, they, they really had not had a lot of success. I think they maybe won 21 season in the NAI back in the 1990s. But, you know, the, the things were here. Things were here with this framework to, to build a program. So, And I brought in good assistant coaches with me and able to sign a few good players. So things have fallen into place pretty well. Well, that's great. And, Coach, I want to get into one of the topics that I, I want to know about. And, and I've heard this from a few people. So are you okay talking about your scrimmage philosophy? And this is something different because I think, again, there's an obsession, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there seems to be an obsession in NCAA basketball about off-season conditioning and, you know, these skill development workouts and everything else. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those, but I think one of the things that coaches tend to miss is these opportunities for players to develop in five-on-five through scrimmages and different things like that. So can you talk a little bit about some of that? Is that just an off-season philosophy or is that an in-season philosophy as well? Both. And obviously, during the offseason, we don't do traditional conditions. And now that we're allowed to spend more hours on the court with players, and, and you get a few players who are leaders that coaches can leave the court, we play a lot more five on five. But the way we play is exhausting. You know, it's forward, face guard, man to man, trap, chase. It's not their nature to play that way. And I kind of have an agreement with our players that if you play that way in the offseason uh, and you push yourself really hard, then we're not going to do conditioning. And I've kind of found that you get in shape both mentally and physically then, not just physically, but you learn how to how to get in shape and run at the right times and sprint at the right times. And and there's an agreement with myself and the players. There's a lot of trust in our, on our program between myself and the players. And every now and then, you know, if I feel like they're not giving me what I need in those open gyms, five-on-five five scrimmage situations, and we'll put the balls down, and we'll do like every other team in the country. We'll start running suicides, and I try to make it strenuous enough that they don't want to do it again because I don't want to do it again. That's not how I coach. It's not how I want to do things. We do things live scrimmage. There's competition. There's winners and losers. And I think in a system like mine where players probably make more decisions on the floor than any team in the country, both offensively and defensively, they have to get a lot of live play with me looking at tape, going over it with them, and, and doing it live on the spot with a whistle. Well, it makes sense to me, Coach, and I'm a big big proponent of decision-making, and I think that's one of the parts that, that we neglect in our coaching in, in all seasons of basketball. So, And that would be the other reason, above and everything else, is that your players are constantly making decisions in the style that you want to play during the year. So whether it's the off-season or in-season, you're putting them in so many situations where they have to make decisions. Is there anything that you particularly focus on at different phases of the year while you're doing that? You know, we talk about what we call the process here. It's a three-part process that goes into that decision-making. It starts from day one, and it, the process is, number one, you got to see the game, and two, you got to be able to analyze it quickly, and three, you have to be able to react. And, you know, those three parts, you know, they happen 
pretty much simultaneously. I mean, you know, what you see is the speed of light and how you analyze it is neurons going to your brain. So this has happened so quickly, but it is a, you know, it's systemic. You, have one, you can't go to one without the other. And what we see, I think, is the one thing I probably focus on more early because I find it's hard to believe you would think that players see the game. Visually, what they look at would be the easiest to teach, but it's not. If you watch players, you put an ice light camera on a kid and they look at the floor, they look at things they shouldn't be looking at. And instead, it's constantly looking at the game, offensively and defensively, and seeing the game because you sure can't analyze and you can't react unless you see things. So we actually spend a lot of time, you know, I'll, I'll hit the whistle and make players, everybody close their eyes and say, okay, tell me where the ball's at. Tell me where, where your teammates are at. Tell me where the defense is at. Tell me what's going on right now. What could happen from this situation? And you're going to find they don't even know where they're at half the time. They don't know the, where the ball is. So getting to see the game is probably what we do more early on and then go from there into analyzing and reacting. Well, and that's, that's a great point because scrimmage is a misnomer here in the sense that you're still present, you're still coaching them. This isn't players just free play on their own, although I'm sure there's some of that that happens within what your program does as well. But can you talk specifically about some of the things that you do address during scrimmage or, or how you address them? You've talked about stopping and starting to get them to visualize. What are some other things that you do within the scrimmage to get them to focus on what you want them to? Yeah, as a coach, you're wondering how often do I hit the whistle? You know, because you could hit the whistle every two or three seconds and stop play and say, yeah, I don't really like what you're doing. You know, I don't like the spacing. I don't like where you're cutting. I don't like your defensive stance. There's a million things that you could do. So you got to first figure out how often do I hit the whistle, keep this progress going when we still want to get conditioning and play. But I really feel like when you're running a motion offense, which we do, it's generated by player decision making. And you're running a defensive pressure system when guys, they're making decisions when they want to double, how they want to trap, where they want to be in the full court pressure, and what is, we call it a high risk type pressure and a low risk, and what's free trapping and what's expensive trapping. You know, when you're doing this, you need to hit the whistle and just say, stop, get everybody's attention for four or five seconds, and say, in this situation, it may never happen again. Here's what I would do. And what you end up getting is a lot of players questioning, Coach, should I do this? Should I do that? And I preface every single answer with the same thing. Look, this is what I do in this situation. But this situation may never happen again. So it's really hard to, uh, you know, if you make drills and stuff, everything is contrived. And you, they don't have to see it because it's already been laid out there for them. They don't have to analyze it. You've already analyzed it for them. But in a running situation, everything is always different. And you're getting players to, to learn how to – I guess learn how to play. It would be the general concept, but it's, it's hard to do in practice every single day. You got to hit the whistle when you think it's the right time. And every coach is different. They're going to emphasize what they think is important and what they should let go. It's a process that you can't relax as a coach. I can tell you that. And if you do, it's not going to go well for you. And what you're doing in terms of getting them to heighten their mental effort, which is getting them to think, is rare. It really is rare. And I try and explain that to coaches all the time when I go watch practices basically all over the world that I've seen. And there's just so many drill-based practices where a player doesn't have to think at all. And I assume, based on what you're saying, you do very little drill work and you do any type of isolated on-air, meaning no defensive work, or is most of it... We do a little, been, yeah. a little bit, mostly warm-up work. But we do less that type of drill work than the average team, for sure. Because, again... You know, the process we're talking about, if I make up a drill, then they don't have to see, already been told what's going on, and they don't have to make a decision. I've already told them what the decision's going to be and how they're going to react to it. They just kind of step in place, and we do a little bit of that. I think, you know, that piece work where you break down into, into pieces, whether we one man, two man, three man, we do a little bit of that, but not very much. And I, I find out that sometimes the carryover, whether it's, let's say, a box out drill, you know, you, you can put together a box out drill and they do a great job and you throw the ball and start playing and they don't box out. You know, it, it's just not quite the same. And you don't always get that carryover from those drills and this piece work. And I find sometimes you're better off to work backwards. You're a live action. And the guy misses a box out, hit the whistle and say, look what you just cost us. You can't afford to do that as opposed to doing a drill on a box out. So it's just a different philosophy that we have here that involves a lot of live scrimmaging and a lot of coaches critiquing. My assistant coaches don't hit the whistle. They pull guys off on the sideline because if we were all doing it, we'd have to stop it just in play. 
but I do, and they do. They critique players as they pull them off to the side. Well, you're talking my language. I love that, and you're absolutely right that most drill-based work or isolated training doesn't transfer to the game. So it's great to hear this philosophy, and there, it raises some questions that I know people will want to ask. So when you guys are scrimmaging, are you always playing your defensive pressure? And we'll get into your philosophy a little bit, but is that defensive pressure always on within your scrimmages, or are there uh, points where you take it off? For the most part, we play our defensive pressure but we can't do that all the time because we're going to face different defenses and we have to look at other teams' defenses. We play a certain amount of what we call half court and back. We're going live in a half court but because we're so transition oriented and because offensively our philosophy is push the ball up aggressively. Offense starts as soon as we get the ball, not when we cross half court. And I talk a lot about you know, pushing the ball and getting spacing and screening and motion and, and transition. And we're a very fast paced team. So we don't get a lot of half-court work. So we have to play half-court and back, which means when you get the ball, you have to get half-court, you turn and go back at that basket, which means you're actually going to get involved in some half-court offense and defense, which a certain percentage of the game is going to be played no matter how hard we try to push the tempo, no matter how hard we try to force an up-tempo, up-and-down game, there will be a certain percentage of the game, whether it be 50 or 30 or 70, that will be played in the half-court set. So we need to get good at that. So we do practice that. We play half court and turn around and come back at you sometimes. And then sometimes we just look at half court stuff. So I, I would say it's a mix in our practice sessions of once the season starts, it's 50-50 against our defense and then also against the other team's defense that we have to be ready for. Well, it's great stuff. And, and the other part that goes with the pressing is I had a coach mention to me that one of the most impressive parts about your team is how quickly – you guys can convert into your pressure and get into it. And I am imagining that is because you practice it in real conditions all the time. That within these scrimmages, it's happening live all the time. So your players get better at getting quickly into the pressure. Is that something that's a big focus within your scrimmages as well? Our lockup top is huge, you know, because everybody has a different philosophy of how they're going to beat our pressure. Some teams will, you know, let the ball roll around for a while and then, when we can get in whatever kind of pressure we want. We'll get who we want on the ball and deny the, the right guy. But some teams are going to grab the net quickly and push it quicker, and we have to lock up faster. So yes, we work on it every day. And we also work on how we're going to press on misses because we're going to press on misses too. You know, we don't run back on defense like most teams. We're going to stay up and apply full-court pressure off misses or if we turn the ball over and they don't push it back at us, if they, if they stop and say, okay, let's slow this thing down, we don't want to give team – a chance to react or relax with the ball and look over to the coach and say, okay, what do you want, coach? We want to keep the pressure on. So we have to work every day on the transition from offense to defense. And whether it's a made shot, whether it's a missed shot, whether it's a turnover, however that ball goes from us to them, we got to look, how can we get into pressure from that situation, which is always going to be different. But the general philosophy of we cannot let them relax with the ball in their hands. Yeah, it kind of comes from the general. The, the first thing we talk about is what we're trying to create here. And I draw a kind of a math guy, and I draw a diagram on the board of a wave of intensity going up and down. And if you watch, that's a lot of Division I games. The intensity game goes up and down. There's a period where they can relax, transporting the ball from one to the other. They might walk it up. Defense is relaxed. Offense is relaxed. It's a, a low-intensity period. And when the guy's coming off a ball screen, which seems to happen a lot, the intensity both offense and defense picks up. We're trying to create a game where that intensity never drops. It stays high all the time, no matter where the ball is, front court, back court, mid court. We don't want them to relax on offense, and we don't want them to relax on defense either. So to do that, we have to lock it up fast. It kind of comes back to that. How do you get into the press quickly? You practice it every day. And you may not get to the exact spot. I was a high school coach that coached more – by design, diamond one, two, two, one, that type of pressure, that you can't do that. You have to have a different type of pressure you can get into quickly. You know, there's only four of them on particular ball to bounce. There's four of them. we got to find them quick. And it may not be your guy. It could be musical chairs. Grab a guy, grab the ball, and we'll trap from here. Well, and that comes back to what you've said already, that the game is not scripted. It's not this perfectly organized thing. So your players have to adapt, and that's part of the adaptability that, that they learn how to do within how you practice, that it's not this script that they have to follow, that they have to literally figure things out. So that's great. 
Coach, let's talk uh, a little bit about scrimmages because I know someone will ask this. How do you get your players to compete in scrimmage? You already talked a little bit about that stop starts, that you're there, there's coaching interventions, that there's winners and losers. What are you tracking in terms of winners and losers? Is it just points or are there other things? Both. Everything is charted and scored, you know, even in the open gyms. And, and we have managers and we have captains and stuff. They'll write scores down about who, you know, the teams. And teams are always mixed up. They choose their own teams. But they report and they put it on the bulletin board themselves about these are the guys who are one who are winning and they're losing. And there's charts about, okay, what's your record you know, game? They go to 100 by twos and threes today. These are the five guys that won. These are the five guys that lost. And here's the point spread. So they chart winning and losing in the fall. And my team won 27 out of 35 games. And I'm plus 120 on the point spread. And all of a sudden, you start to talk about players' value. Because it is true. You look at some guys, and maybe their numbers don't show up on the stat sheet great. But their winning and losing is to be always showing up. They're the common thread. They're the guy that my team, you know, Coach, I may not have the best numbers, but if you notice, my team wins. And these guys, they all know that we're looking for guys that win. And so, you know, that kind of creates a good atmosphere for playing. They know it's going to be charted. They know their names went up on the board. And if all of a sudden you think you're a good player, but you play with different guys every day and you only won 10% of your games, you're now a common thread for losing. So that's always it's, it's out there, and they know it. They know that they're being charted for everything they do. And even the drills and practice that we do, where there's transition drill, there's a winner and a loser. And I find that guys tend to try harder and it's more fun if there's something on the line every day. So whether it's the losers running or the winners get a t-shirt or something that maybe at the end of practice, I'll tell you one of the scenes that work a good example, just you having a winner and a loser. A lot of time in transition drills, we'll say, okay, the team that wins at the end of the drill, you go over and sit in the bleachers. The team that loses, you go get a cup of water, give it to the guys in the bleachers before you can take a drink. You have to deliver a cup of water to the winning team. Doesn't sound like much. These guys will kill themselves not to give a cup of water to to the winning team. And it's kind of fun. And it brings out the best of them intensity-wise in practice when there's something on the line every day. So everything we do is charted, it's noted. There's winners and losers. I talk about all the time. And guys are even start everything they do say, hey, guys, my team always wins. And I want guys thinking that I'm a winner. I'm going to show you every day that you know, so what if I'm down you know, 15 points right now before it's over, my team's going to win. And that kind of breeds itself into winning. Oh, it's great. And the main stat is winning. And that's, that's great that you, you chart that. And they learn how to compete and they love competing. And that's part of it. I also read a quote that said that you've never read a basketball book in your life. How did you develop this philosophy? Well, that's true, because I don't read a lot of books either. So, <laughs> kinda, uh, <laughs> so that applies to all books. Yeah. <laughs> I've watched a heck of a lot of basketball movies, probably. I think when I got the job at West Liberty, they had never won. And we had to maybe go outside the box a little bit. And I could have gone out of direction. We could have been trying to win games 49, 48. But I chose a different route because I enjoy the game more at up-tempo. If there's anything, you know, because I'm not much of a clinic guy or a, a read books guy, but, you know, I watch basketball on TV and I coached high school basketball for a decade. I remember watching a game one time. I think Patino was coaching and Billy Donovan was playing up in Providence. They had a guy named Del Ray Brooks and, and they were pressing. And the press was random. It was the, the turns were caused from behind. They're caused in so many different ways just by the way they were playing. And there was a lot of chasing from behind. And I had played a lot of dominant one type pressure where you, know, you cut off the side. It was more prescribed for them. And I, I was looking at that pressure, and Providence had made a run into the NCAA. This was probably before your time, Chris. This was a long time ago. No, I remember that had, a little uh, bit. Yeah. It was how they were playing. And I kind of worked backward from there saying, wait a second. Yeah, I'm going to try to create this type of havoc without giving up anything easy, because you don't want to give up a layup. You don't want to give up something easy. You still want to guard the basket. So that kind of shaped my philosophy more than a clinic, just watching the game live. And I even remember when Florida won the national championship when Dick Donovan was coaching. I saw some of that in his team. They had a guy named Brewer. I remember chasing guys down from behind. They were yep. Their style was very similar to that Providence team. I thought, you know, he's carried that with him. I can see that as a player, he had that. And now as a coach, he's kind of got that 
wreaking havoc, but being good at it. You know, I'm not a running gun guy. I'm not a, okay, let's give up something quick so we get the ball back and forth. We don't care how long it takes. We want to get a stop. But we want to do it by applying full court pressure. So if there's anything I did take, it was probably from that route, watching that one game, seeing the success Billy Donovan had again at Florida. I guess I took something from that. And that, that definitely influenced me a little bit about this Havoc-type defense. But there's got to be a little bit of make sense to the madness of, of how you do it. Well, and that's what you're saying. There's calculated risk to this defense. It's not like, again, we're not trying to do anything other than create some havoc, but we're not trying to give up baskets either. So what are some things that you focus in on in your experience with this system to teach your players decision-making in terms of when to trap or when to not trap or different things that happen within this defense? Yeah, I think videotape comes in a little bit there. We'll, we'll review videotape and look and say, you know, Good decision, bad decision. And there's a lot of decisions that are kind of gray. Like, you know, you could trap or you could not trap. And if you're going to go trap, then there's a lot of decisions to be made about, you know, who you're trapping, who you're leaving, what the other team's philosophy is. Are, are they going to attack when you do this? Are they just trying to, you know, slow the game down, which can kind of pin your ears back a little bit more if they're not going to try to score on you? How good are your teammates, you know, in, in rotation? You know, if you got three other teammates that are great in rotation, you've got a lot more ability to – they get a little crazy and go trap someone knowing we can rotate faster and people can move the basketball now, which is hard to do. And, and that takes a lot of the practice. But I think just talking to players in every situation that they're in, explain to them that, you know, what would be a very expensive trap. We're not going to leave a guy open under the basket to, to wrap the corner trap to give someone a layup. But, you know, if a guy reaches down to tie a shoe in the backcourt and he's your guy, that's a free one. You know, then you go trap. You don't, you don't wait on to tie a shoe. That's an extreme example. That's, that's an automatic trap. Leaving a guy underneath a basket to give up a layup, that would be an absolute no. But most things are in between there somewhere. So what you do after Tom, just explain to them what's a good trap, what's a bad trap, to the point where they have to see it, analyze it, and react in a game situation. And it takes time, you know, which is, you know, my MO has always been I've had very few transfers. I've got a few more here now. Than I had at West Liberty, but I only had a couple of transfers in 13 years at West Liberty, and we registered the guys because we had them there for five years and taught them how to play a different type of game that took a long time to learn. Dave Smart is one of the best coaches in the world, and now you can learn from him with never-before-available access. Three all-access practices and one defensive coaching clinic are available at davesmartbasketball.com. What makes these all-access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force Weekend defensive system is world-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. When you're doing video, because you've talked about that a few times, the importance of the video, is it group video? Is it individual video? Is it both? But how are you watching video with your players? When it comes to video, I kind of torture them a little bit. I tend to focus more on the negative things that we do. But I try to pull out some situations where I think, okay, I'm not just criticizing this one player, even though I probably am. But it's something that needs to be learned by everybody across the board. And a lot of them are effort-related because players think they're playing hard. But when you show the video, you find out you're not playing as hard as you thought you were playing. And so we constantly push the, the concept of more effort, but in the video sessions, of course, you know, sometimes you tell them things in a live situation and they're, I think they believe you, but they don't buy in. They think maybe you're wrong as a coach. They would never say that. The players are very respectful. They don't argue, but I can tell. They, they may not buy it as well, but when it's on tape, it's hard to deny. You can just say, there it is. You know, you didn't give the effort. You didn't do the right place. It's cut and dried. So we use tape just to kind of also back up what we're trying to tell them in practice every day. 
Well, it's great. And players are always going to defend their ego to a certain extent. So the video solves that problem. But coach, transitioning a little bit. So the overall philosophy, obviously, we talked a little bit about the pressure defense, the tempo on the defensive end. What are you talking about on offense to your players? And I've heard you say this, and I could not agree more, that there's just so many teams that don't really try and score in transition, even though, you know, they could talk about fast break all they want, but they're not truly trying to score in transition on a primary break. So what are the things that you are emphasizing with this philosophy? It is you know, the philosophy of attacking immediately as soon as we get the ball, not when we get up in the scoring area, about how to run lanes, how to space, how to screen in transition, and how not to have a period where you push the ball off the court and now we're going to run an offense. That couple of seconds of you pull it out and say set something up. We don't ever want to set anything up. So offensively, we want guys that can push the ball constantly and handle the ball and pass the ball and see the game better than anybody else sees the game. And that's hard to teach every single day. But it's what we have with players making decisions now. You still with me? Yeah, absolutely. It's great stuff. You know, that decision-making process of screening and cutting is something that I feel like I've never been able to master with my team. And I'm never – they don't screen, they don't cut, they don't space well, but yet we're still scoring at a high rate and a high efficiency rate. And I keep thinking if we ever really get the hang of this, we're going to be really good offensively. But if you watch a lot of games, you know, I I define a lot of games I see on TV as they kind of push them off the court but not really looking to score. And the first 10 seconds, they're doing almost nothing that really attacks Somewhere the shot clock gets down around 12. Here comes the high ball screen, and then it starts there. And it comes down to just that. Well, I coach in the FIBA I game, so I do feel like sometimes it's not even the first 10 seconds. Sometimes it's the first 20 seconds they're not even trying to score. So I totally yeah, understand what exactly. you're saying. I agree with Charles Barkley. Charles and I are on, on you know, the same page, but I, <laughs> I, I listen to him even against those teams playing the Final Four. He said these teams have got – they got to stop waiting for the last five seconds of the shot clock to look to score. And I think a lot of that stuff is, that they do prior to that, it's kind of fake in the score. There's not, you can tell they're not really attacking. So, you know, we're trying to avoid that. We don't want to take bad shots. We don't come down and rush shots. Our philosophy is you've got to get a high percentage shot with guys in rebounding position. But we don't have to wait 20 seconds before we change our philosophy. It's the same as when we get the ball as it is with 10 seconds on the shot clock. It's a tax space. You know, put, don't be afraid to put them on the floor and try to get to the rim early. So a little different philosophy, I think, offensively we have where we kind of stay away from that early on. You, you look differently at the rim than you do with the last 10 seconds. A huge part of that philosophy is permission, right? That you're giving your players freedom to be able to play. And I think that's the part that some coaches, like they want to play fast, they want a fast break, but then they don't give their players freedom because they want to control the possession and they want to have this perfect looking possession. And I'll say, coach, when I watched your games on Synergy, that was one thing that I noticed, that it wasn't always the perfect spacing. It wasn't always the perfect situation. But your players were attacking and attacking with such confidence that they almost always created advantage. That's part of it? Yes. If we can ever get good ads, we're going to have a good team. You know, the space, <laughs> the spacing is not good. And, and I've never really talked about what we do offensively, but I, I know seven or eight years ago, I kind of made a point to say, I'm not looking to advertise anything here. And I had a friend call me and say, Hey, look, I see you sold out. And I saw you put a book out there on the internet. And there was actually a book you could buy saying the West Liberty Jim Crutchfield offense, but someone had actually taken a couple of our games and just diagram whatever we did in motion offense and said, this is our offense. Now guys are screwing up every single possession. We've got guys setting ball screens and running <laughs> at them. So this person was diagramming bad things and putting and made it into a book and sold it. And I thought, well, you're diagramming mistakes. You know, our guys are make tons of mistakes. This, this is not the flex offense, which looks good on paper, but yeah, this, these are guys going where they think they should go and they're making a lot of mistakes. I think you have to, as a coach, you have to kind of go through a lot of mistakes, process of trying to get good at motion offense and giving players freedom. I lost but if our players are not continually attacking, then they're okay. okay. If you want to continue again with that thought, if you remember it. Well, I'm just talking about how our players, they have to play with confidence. And if they're not confident players, they don't work well in our system because they have to be willing to attack the basket 
and look to score immediately. And guys that aren't looking to score probably don't fit in our offense very well. Now, is there a spacing template? Like when you're talking about primary break, or like you're talking about getting it, get it in. First of all, who's taking the ball out of bounds, coach? Closest guy. Closest guy. And then from there, yep. is there a designated point guard? Or are there designated wings? Or is it just closest guy and fly? Theoretically, everybody's playing the same position. However, guys will migrate to their strengths. Now, even though I don't designate, I want you to get the inbounds pass. Or guys tend to throw it to the same guy. They know what players' strengths are, which is part of the motion offense. You know, you got to know your players, too. The guys that can run lanes, run lanes. The guys that can post up, post up. So they theoretically are in the same position, but they go to their strengths. And there's guidelines. If two guys are running side by side down the same sideline, they need to split. One of them cut to the basket, one pop the three-point line. They need to get away from each other as quickly as possible in scoring positions. So there are certain guidelines. But after that, very few rules on the players except good spacing, how to cut off of each other, and make yourself available to the basketball. And on the catch in range, if they're open, they shoot it. If they're a shooter, and if not, are you emphasizing pass? Or you, you're, it sounds like you're emphasizing drive the ball, right? A little bit of everything. And I've yep. always kind of had that philosophy of you tell a guy you're a three-point shooter, but I had trust guys if they get a clean look from the three-point line and all of a sudden the guy flashes open to the basket, that they'll see him. You know, they're, they, they won't make that mistake. So, you know, I've always found that players shoot the ball a little bit better if they have a little more confidence. And part of my job as a coach is just try to instill a little bit of confidence in them without saying, come on, you can make shots, because that just usually takes the confidence away. Just tell them, you know, shoot them. Just shoot the ball. You know, 40% are going to go in. Give it a good stroke. It's great stuff. And so your players obviously, I would think, love the system. They love to play this way. Is that part of this philosophy as well, that your players seem to enjoy it so that they would compete for each other and for the system a little bit harder? They do. And sometimes they do without even knowing it because they, they'll go play somewhere else and say, I don't like playing what they call regular basketball. I, you know, I like playing this kind of basketball where they're not pigeonholed into positions or responsibilities, where they have a little more flexibility to do everything. They do enjoy it. They don't like the pressure. Every kid that's ever come in office as a recruit that says, I want to play this way until they have to get in the press. No one's ever walked in my office, sat across my desk and said, coach, I'm more of a slowdown guy. Uh, this is, I don't want to play the up tempo. They all think they do, but to be able to face guard someone and trap them and then chase them down from behind and react quickly even when you're tired, it's very difficult to do. And they find that out, but that's part of the game we play. So it's really hard what you're talking about though, because it's, it's really hard to get players to play with, confidence and freedom but to maximize possessions so again is that part of the film study is that part of the emphasis within practice where you would stop and start scrimmages is to be able to maximize possessions and get them to understand the value or advantage are you talking about advantage disadvantage every day and part of it is in this process of playing so-called fast you, know, you wear teams out and every now and then you get the ball back and if you get down and take a bad shot quickly you force their team to not play any defense. And when a team gets tired, they don't want to defend. You're going to find they don't play the same defense the first possession of the game. They lock up tighter. They're in the gaps better. Everything's better. Then after about 10 minutes of playing up tempo basketball, the gaps seem to get a little bit bigger. And they have a hard time defending, cutting, and screening. So if you, you know, that, that thin line between we want to play fast, but let's, let's make your team play some defense when they're tired too. So that's that maximizing possessions every single time. You know, you want to take it down, and if you don't have a great shot, you want to keep working hard because you got a tired defense, and you'll find your shot here eventually. But let's not let them off the hook by taking a bad shot, not maximize the possession, and also you know, giving them a break because they didn't have to defend one possession. Well, and I imagine that's a question for coaches that are thinking in their minds, listening, and how are you defining shot selection in this system? Are you subbing for bad shots? Are you teaching later for bad shots? Or is there a bad shot, I guess, is part of it, too? Yeah, yeah. You know, guys, everybody has to understand what their shot selection is. Not, you know, that's never really been a problem. Guys seem to understand what shots they can make and what they, they're good at and what they're bad at. And they go to their strengths there, too. I rarely sub for bad shots. Usually 
subbing is a guy's tired, a positional sub for it makes sense, or a guy I thought maybe didn't give great effort. But, you know, when you sub a guy for missing a shot, then you're starting to flirt with his confidence maybe a little bit too. You know, usually when a, if a guy, especially if he takes a good look, a three or a good shot, I'm always reluctant to pull them then after they miss it because now you are going to break a player's confidence. So you don't really want to do that. I tend to want to break the fact they didn't play hard. So I sub more when I feel like a player is not giving maximum effort. Well, I want to note this, Coach, because you said this twice where it's never really a problem. You've talked about roles and you've talked about shot selection. And I believe there's a direct correlation between your scrimmage philosophy and those two things. Because your players are worried, well, not worried, maybe that's not the right word, that they care every day about winning and losing, that those things are defined by the players much easier because they're going to value those things because they want to win in practice. They want to win in scrimmage. Does that make sense? You're exactly right. You are exactly right. I'll tell you what I like is when I see him scrimmaging live and a guy takes what would be a questionable shot and I'll hear one of the players in a nice way say, you know, don't settle, don't settle. And they're telling them, don't settle for that shot. You know, let, we can find a better one. It's a nice way of saying you're a better player than that. We want to win really bad. Don't take that fadeaway long do with a guy at the hand in your face. You know, get the ball to the rim. We'll get a clean look to the right guy for a three. They know what good shots are. You're smarter players. And I recruit smart players. Half our players are coaches' sons. So they understand this concept. And when I hear them, so don't, don't settle for that one. That's just exactly what you're talking about. They want to win. You're in a nice way saying that's probably not a good shot. I love that. And, uh, you know, empowering the players to learn and through certainly through, again, game-based play like this is great. And, Coach, I think you're going to get a bunch of resumes from Coach's sons now. So that's going to help recruiting too. Um, <laughs> pace of play and the style. And this is a buzzword, and wherever you want to go with this is fine, but workload management. What's the impact of this pace of play on the demands on the bodies or how long you practice or whatever, wherever you want to go with this? But I know that's constantly a thought in people because if I do know a little bit about you guys, you don't play that deep all the time either, do you? No, but, you know, in today's world where, you know, we've got so many media timeouts and time, you know, Division Two has made a mistake where they've copied division one when it comes to media timeouts. We don't actually have media. We're not making any money, but we, we stopped the game anyway, nine times a game. Coaches East get four timeouts. We're looking at 15 to 17 timeouts a game, stopping the game a couple of times to see if it was a flagrant foul or was his foot on the line. There's plenty of breaks in the game. So players have a chance to get a breath. So I've never been a, a big proponent of, well, you, you got to rest the guy 10 minutes a game. Yeah, we play them longer. And I ask players, you know, and you, are you pushing okay? And how long do you have to sit out? You sit out for a minute, you're ready to get back in. And let's keep our best players on the floor. Well, I couldn't agree with that more. And do you find you practice less with this type of philosophy in terms of the duration of a practice? Or are you going just yeah, as long? Yeah, we're up-tempo. Our practices are very up-tempo. When I hit the whistle, I try to keep it under 10 seconds. You know, as a coach, when your players are starting, you're, you're talking, they're wavering back and forth on, from foot to foot, like they're getting dead legs. You're talking too long. So we keep the tempo up, keep it aggressive, put our hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes on the court, and watch a few minutes of tape and call it a day usually. Well, that's great. And, and what could be better than conditioning the way the games play too? I mean, your players don't even know that they're conditioning, but they're conditioning every day playing. That's, that's the best way to condition by far. Exactly. And what are some other things that we would notice if we came and watch one of your practices? You said you do a little bit of individual skill stuff. Otherwise, you're going these full court, half court trips. And what are some other things that you would see in a practice at your at Nova Southeastern? You know, I think I've had, a, you know, we get people come and watch us practice pretty regularly. And the one compliment that we get that I really appreciate is the fact they're playing hard, but they're having fun. And our players do laugh every day. I think, you know, they're, I like for them to have a little bit of fun, but not let the fun bleed over into being goofy and playing sloppy basketball. If you can have fun and still play hard, it's a good practice for us. And I, I think you'll see a little bit of that. Well, that's great. And that's certainly not, I mean, it's such an important part of the experience for athletes. And again, that comes back to, I think, your overall philosophy, which is giving your players freedom and empowering them. But that's great. You talked about creating gaps. What are some of the ways then now we're in the half court, whether we got there fast or we got there slow on dead ball, what are some ways that you're trying to create gaps for your players to drive or attack? 
Well, I think the gaps are easier to find in that, I guess, what people would call a secondary break. We don't have a secondary break. But, you know, I guess we have every secondary break. But if you look at the final four, they're all playing the same defense. I mean, that defense makes sense. You, know, you, you protect the basket. You use all five guys and you close down gaps. The pack line defense, and you see whether it's Virginia, they're all playing it. Everybody was playing the same defense. No one's playing full court pressure because – on a grease board, full court pressure doesn't make sense. It gets beat. You have to be a little crazy to play it, which we probably are. But in that pack line gap defense, I think if you let teams remain at full strength, it's almost like they're playing the same game, so they're playing five on five. They didn't push it down. I think they'd rather go five on five and five on four sometimes. I've seen guys with the basketball push down like, wait a second, he'll protect the ball to let the defense set up and say, okay, here we go. And for us, it's a mistake because it's hard to get those gaps in that situation. I think the gaps are easier to find in transition when you're pushing the ball. You might get a four-on-four situation instead of a five-on-five. They don't have the right man. But these teams are getting better and better at that pack line defense. And, you know, all you do is watch the, the NCAA Division One tournament saying these teams are getting harder to score on. They're athletic. They're long. They know how to play that defense. I think the key is – is don't let them lock in on you. You know, try to get them in transition some. And then once they're there, hopefully they didn't plan it for 15 seconds instead of letting them relax the first 10 seconds we talked about earlier, and maybe they'll make a mistake. Maybe we can get through a gap and penetrate and find the open guy. But I, I think it's getting more and more difficult to play against that defense because teams are getting more athletic and they're getting better at it. Maybe the other thing that I notice, Coach, is that you tend to play through the elbows a lot. Now, this is going back to West Liberty, maybe a little bit more. I haven't watched as much in Nova Southeastern. But when you do want to get a certain player, I don't know what you call it. I would call it a matchup. So you want to get a matchup, an opportunity to attack, that you're trying to get them somewhere in the elbows, the nail area, to be able to ISO and attack. Is that still the yeah, case? Is that something? Yeah, Yeah, you picked up something pretty important to us there. I, and that's, again, coming from my philosophy. If you can attack from the elbows in that part of the court, then there's no real – offside, weak side defense, where you can pass the ball to either side. You know, when you hit the ball to the wing, if you run like a UCLA cut and you throw it to the wing, these teams are going to, you know, to the midline and over. And you've got five defenders on that side of the floor, and you take away part of the floor offensive that can't be used, which would be the weak side, because if you throw over top, they're fast. They'll, they'll get there. They're lucky if you don't pick the pass off. If you have the ball at the elbows or somewhere in that area, you can attack both to the left and right as a pass and off the dribble, which means defenders can't quite get off their man quite as far from there. If you follow what I'm saying, if you, if you got the ball at the elbow, you know, there is no weak side as much as if you got the ball on the wing. So we find the gaps are a little bit better attacking from the top elbow to elbow area where you can both pass the ball. If a guy runs a good screen on the left side, or the right side, you're still close enough to make that pass and find an open guy forcing defenders to the guard guys a little closer out wide. So maybe you can put the ball on the floor and get to the rim from there. Well, I couldn't agree more. I would, might argue in this game, based on the defenses that you talked about already, it may be the only place on the floor where you're almost guaranteed to get a score for the matchup or a great kick out when they help on the matchup because it's a really hard place to help. And again, I just noticed that, that you guys seem to do a tremendous job when, whenever, and I don't know if those are ATOs or those are half court sets or is that set action or is that happen in the flow, but you did a great job getting players in an isolation situation at the elbows. Is that coming from a script or is that more just in the flow? Both more from scripts. And you know, our goal is not run a lot of set plays. Most of our set plays are quick hitters, but almost all of them deliver the ball to the elbow area. And we have always a threat of a back cut from there, so they can't deny the ball there. We try to open up space for a back cut, which means we can usually get the ball there. And from there, we can attack. So, yeah, that's mostly out of sign plays, but we talk about motion offense. Don't throw the ball to the corner unless you think there's a, a shot or a pass to the post because now we got to get the ball back up to where we can score from elbow to elbow. Are you playing any through a traditional low post or do, do you have a traditional low post after you're trying to hit a head down the middle at some point, but then are you playing with the traditional low post or are you more five out or what's the spacing? Five man motion. We don't, we don't have a traditional post up. Yeah. Anybody has the option. They can pin a guy inside the post up and I've had guards are probably were 
focus on more than our big guys, and our bigs are usually pretty good shooters. But we are a five-man motion offense. The post is available to anybody. I'm not going to have a guy that's going to be a traditional post-up player because so much of our offense is you're cutting and drill penetration into that area. A post-up guy would kind of have to restructure our offense a little bit if we had a guy that remained on the block. No, and that makes sense based on the style and the philosophy that you're playing with. And coach, maybe it may be a little bit of a reflection here, but what is something you believed in before about the game of basketball that you don't anymore? Because what strikes me is that you're a very deep thinker about the game. So what are some things that you used to believe in, but you don't anymore? Well, that's a tough one. You know, I've, I've been pretty consistent about my thoughts and uh, I'd probably like to tell you that you know, at one time I was controlling everything and I thought a coach had to control everything because as a high school coach, I did. I did not run any motion in offense and the defense was way more prescribed. So I've changed that philosophy, almost a 180 complete turnaround about giving the power to the players and then making sure they use, make good use of it. So if, if anything's changed, it's been me taking my hand off the gear shift and my friend uh, Duger Balkan calls them joystick coaches because he's kind of a, a freewheeling kind of coach down at Citadel. And he said, a lot of coaches, you think the more you control, the better you're coaching. I'm not so sure about that. I think you need to learn how to lose a little bit of control and you gain something out of it. So I've done a 180 on that since I started coaching basketball, which was at age 22, which is now 40 years ago. So a lot, there's a lot of time in between there. Just a few years ago, just a few years ago, coach. That's great. And the other thing that strikes me a little bit about this is that this philosophy of playing this style is something that makes you a better game coach because you're constantly coaching the game the way it's played in practice as well. And I think a lot of people miss the boat on that, that when they run these really scripted drill-based practices, they don't give themselves as an opportunity to coach both sides of the ball in practice. And imagining you're a better game coach because of this philosophy as well. Maybe. And sometimes we, you know, we play the last couple of minutes of a game out a lot in practice. We'll play two minutes out and, and it gives me a chance to, to react how I'm going to react. And I'm not really sure, but you know, I saw something in a game this year. I think it was Purdue. I don't, if you caught the end of the Purdue game, got a great coach, both teams had great coaches there. And, but they had a guy that was really hot that had scored. It hit, I think it hit 10 threes. And they had the ball out with uh, five seconds to go, and we're down three. Coach up a nice play for a guy come off a screen in the corner. But the player who had made the threes broke free at half court and had a one dribble away from a clean look at the three to tie the game. But he threw the ball down the sideline to the play the coach had drawn up. And it went out of bounds. It deflected off his hand, went out of bounds, where the player who had made the 10 threes actually had a look to get to the three himself. But being a good player, he ran with the coach wanting to run. And I think, I don't, I don't want to eliminate all the other possibilities by trying to draw something, one play up, and say, this is the play. Sometimes you're better off to say, hey, look, guys, you got five seconds. Let's see what you can find. And practice it every day saying, here's some general guidelines we want to look at, how it's face and cut, but let's see, let's see what happens, as opposed to drawing up the one play that kind of limits the other 999 possibilities. So it, it, it kind of back every day in practice about letting guys learn how to make decisions. It keeps falling back to that on both offense and defense. Well, I love that. It's just a tremendous philosophy, tremendous way to play for both players and I believe for you as a coach. So Coach Crutchfield, thank you so much for taking the time. I know there's a lot of people that are curious about what you've been doing down there and uh, I really appreciate you taking some time and sharing the game with us. Hey, I always enjoy talking basketball. Appreciate the time for you too. Awesome. Basketball Immersion is one-stop shopping for video learning to stimulate your basketball coaching using evidence-based practices. Watch hundreds of videos covering BDT shooting, zero-second skill training, how we teach using small-sided games and a games approach to coaching, as well as team concepts and systems like trail trap, flow offense, two-sided fast break, and much, much more. NCAA NBA, pro, high school, and youth coaches are amongst the thousands of coaches who are a part of our community. Go to basketballimmersion.com today to stimulate your basketball coaching.
To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.